Greetings everyone. Welcome to the 179th session of the online Optom Learning Series OLS. And for today's session, we have with us uh, two speakers who is going to share with us their expertise in terms of scleral lenses, red eye differentials. So we have, we have with us Dr. Christine Sin. Dr. Christine is a 1994 graduate of the Ohio State University College of Optometry. She has also completed a disease-based residency, and she is more towards the subspeciality of contact lenses as well as low vision when she did her residency. She's joined the faculty of the University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in 1995, where currently she is the professor of clinical ophthalmology and the director of the contact lens services. Dr. Sint is the fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and also a past president and co-founder of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Most importantly, I think a lot of people know her as the designer and founder of the iPrint Prosthesis Custom Impression Scleral Lens Technology. So welcome, ma'am, uh, and thank you for joining us thank this you. morning, your time. Uh, to join Dr. Sindh, we have uh, Dr. Marcus, who is a clinical assistant professor in the Speciality Contact Lens Clinic at the University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science. He is a graduate from the University of Houston College of Optometry, and then he went ahead and did a dual residency in cornea and contact lenses, as well as in ocular diseases. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. And he also dedicates his time and serves on the board of the fellowship of the Scleral Lens Education Society. So welcome, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with that, uh, I would, uh, you know, like to leave the screen time to you and take us through your talk and, uh, you know, advise us on what are scleral lenses in terms of red eye differentials. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having us. I don't know about you, Marcus, but scleral lenses and red eyes, I think our other, our other title could have been a day in our life. Yeah, exactly. Th these are something that every single person sees, or if you're a scleral practitioner, it pops up every day, especially for us. It's not always the fit. It's There's many things that go into this. So let's kind of exactly. dig in here. <laughs> Whoops. Yep. So we'll, we'll just jump into it. So here are the disclosures. And then Dr. Sin, if you want to take these first couple slides, we'll. Sure. In. Yeah. So what, what are we really talking about? That's important on scleral lenses, right? So do you have, we say RSVP return to our clinic. If you have redness, secretions, visual blurring, or pain. The eye, the eye is kind of a, a stupid organ, right? It only knows how to do those one of those four things. So Every complication that we have uh, with scleral lenses, with any contact lens, just in the eye in general, it's going to show up as redness, secretions, visual blurring, or pain. So today we're really going to talk about the redness aspect of that and how it relates to, uh, to scleral lenses. So we are learning on this. And I, I have to tell you, I've, you know, I've learned things Friday that I will continue to use, you know, next week. And just when I think I know something, I don't know anything, right? I'm, I don't know about you, Marcus, but I feel like I think, oh, I really know this topic. And then all of a sudden I'm in clinic looking at a patient and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> exactly. You, you probably know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's the opposite because it, but for me, it's great because anytime I don't know anything, I just ask you. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and then we make each other feel better that we don't know it. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> So don't feel bad, uh, you know, if, if things come up in your clinic, you know, we're all learning, we're all learning this together. So, yes. All right. So if you have got a money shot to take, I, um, I would recommend screen capturing this one slide. Now we're always adding things uh, under it, but, but pretty much red eyes are going to fall into one of these categories. It's going to be inflammatory. <laughs> always, always seems to be inflammatory, right, Marcus? Your eyes are red because yep. it's inflamed. Uh, yep. Mechanical, hypoxic, hypersensitivity reaction, infectious, chemical, or or dry eye. So we'll go through each of these categories. 
So the first one is inflammatory, which we have a couple of the um, key or big players listed there, GVHD, SJS, and autoimmune. Um, there's episodic and systemic, which I think, Chris, this is one of your patients before we flip yeah. into mine. Yeah. So, so what we have to remember with some of these underlying inflammatory diseases is they may be quiet for a very long period of time and then have a flare. So before you, you know, jump in to change the fit, you need to make sure that you actually have the disease calm. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to send them back uh, for systemic steroids or, you know, systemic treatment of, of that disease. And, but the systemic issue will change your contact lens fit, not only on the globe itself, but on the eyelids. So if you, if you see this, this picture on the right here, these, these uh, patients tend, their eyelids tend to become very fibrotic, very inflamed. You see that little tiny circle patch there? That's the only area on that lid that is not actually fibrotic itself. So uh, you need to make sure you look at the globe, but also under the lid. Sometimes you get some blepharons or other issues where you can't flip the lid, but always make sure you look under the lid and then record exactly what you have going on so that you know when you have change. Excellent. Yeah. And I, this next slide that I have here is just kind of a case that really kind of sum this up. So this is a, a patient that I had a couple of years back with really, really nasty graft versus host disease. Um, as you can see in these pictures, um, this is the, the trial lenses that we put on this patient. So this is the first time he's actually worn trials, but even looking through the sclerals, you can see all that Neo, all of the mucus stuck to the lenses. Um, in this picture in the middle here, you can see just how much his, his cornea is thinned from the, just all the inflammation over time. Um, the GVHD patients are kind of the, the textbook patient for inflammation because they are extremely uncomfortable, but can get massive, massive improvement with a scleral. So I'm just going to walk through a brief case on this quick. So just a quick background on, on graft versus host. Graft versus host is due to bone marrow transplants, and it's actually an immune response against the host, hence graft versus the host. Um, often you'll hear patients complain of dryness, you'll see neovascularization, a bunch of mucus, lid telangiectasia, just basically anything inflammatory. Uh, how do you manage it? Typically it's managed with artificial tears, um, things like restasis, and then scleral lenses is kind of the, the new big ticket item there. So for this patient's case, I had a 55 year old male come in and he was referred by the VA. He did have a bone marrow transplant, was positive for GVHD and dryness. How he far was, out, Marcus, was he from, from his bone marrow transplant when you saw him? I don't know, actually. The VA didn't send the records over, but from when he said it was at least 10 years. So it was a long time. Okay. Typically, these patients become symptomatic at, um, at about nine months, eight or nine months. Yeah, usually the cutoff for an acute type GVHD is usually within that nine month, six month period. And then chronic would be after the six or month period is kind of the, the gold standard of how people treat it. And actually about 80% of people who get GVHD have ocular signs. So it's very, very common in patients who have had the bone marrow transplants. But uh, yeah, thanks for adding that. Um, when this patient came in, his right eye was 20 slash 350, and he pinholed to 2150 in the right eye, left eye 2080 to pinhole 2050. So he did show a little improvement with pinhole. Um, his slow lamp exam showed he had some misdirected eyelashes, also a ton of scarring, a ton of neovascularization, thinning, and late staining from limbal stem cell deficiency that he'd picked up along all this inflammation and damage. So for this patient, we wanted, I used a 19 millimeter scleral lens in cases with ocular surface disease. You often want to use the largest lens you can because it'll cover more of the ocular surface. And then in this case, to improve tear exchange, we added some lens channels into the back of the lens, which we'll get into in a second. So again, here's the, the slit lamp photograph and you could, all those things we talked about earlier, you can see the, the corneal thinning there, um, all the mucus and non-wetting from the lens and that corneal neo. 
Um, this is a kind of zoomed in picture of those lens channels, which are essentially little um, gradations on the underside of the lens, which the thought is to help tear exchange um, happen. And with patients with ocular surface disease, you want as much tear exchange as you can, make sure that it gets oxygen and nutrients. You know, Marcus, I'm going to yeah. um, ask you a question right here. Um, you know, typically these people are going to develop a, a lot of mucus, a lot of mucus, yeah. all, all of these inflammatory conditions. And what we hear a lot about on the internet and in these Facebook chat groups and things like that is people start saying, if you don't want debris, they focus on the debris, they focus on the cloudiness underneath the contact lens, the, the cloudy symptoms that the patient's having. Mm -hmm. And they say, uh, tighten up the lens, tighten up the periphery so that you don't get debris from, from the um, ocular surface or from the tear film coming in under and, and, and being in underneath the lens. But the problem is when you're having mucus, when you have debris, it's because you have a, a, a level of inflammation in that eye because there's some dryness, because there's some inflammation. But that is the reason that you're getting mucus. And uh, by tightening it up, in, in, in a way, you're going to trap mucus or, or trap inflammatory products underneath that lens. So I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying here, Marcus, because I think, I think this is really important. You're saying yeah. we need to have the lens a little looser because it exchanges the fluid underneath there and it helps control that level of inflammation. Yes, just even to expand a, a touch into that. So I, I tell patients this sometimes, or even just other practitioners, when your eyes inflamed and irritated, it doesn't want friction, right? Your eyelids just rubbing on your eye, your eye doesn't want that when it's inflamed. So it creates mucus to get rid of some of that friction. But the other thing it creates, like you said, is those inflammatory protein cells, all that stuff. And again, just agreeing, if, if the lens is tight, then that can get stuck behind the lens, get stuck on the lens and cause the fogging. So yeah, 100% agree. Thanks for slowing that down for a sec. Which is, yeah, it's a little counterintuitive to what you hear from other people. Uh, but these people are sick and we can't make them sicker, right? Because exactly. trapped inflammatory products is going to drive more inflammation. Yep. It agreed 100%. So basically, like I said, this was just a, a pretty quick case here. Um, but at the dispense, the, the patient's vision was 2080 in the right eye, 2050 in the left. He was over the moon. Uh, he, he actually told me that it felt like his eyes had gotten a sunburn every day for the last 10 years. And then when he put these lenses in for the first time, it felt like he finally had some cooling relief. So for him, he didn't care, like for the vision it improved, which is great, but he didn't care at all about the vision. He was just excited he could keep his eyes open without having any pain. And so just like what Dr. Sint was saying, it's very easy to get lost in the, how do I optimize this fit? But you have to remember that the patients are sick and you need to be treating their underlying condition. And sometimes if their the ocular comfort can be equally or even more important as vision to some patients. So very important to keep it in mind. You are treating the disease, not designing a scleral. Mm -hmm. So moving on from there, here's just a couple more um, inflammatory eyes. The one on the left there is a Stevens Johnson syndrome are obviously wearing a scleral there and you can see that I had a little bubble right there, but don't tell anyone. And then on the right hand side, there's a neurotrophic keratitis, which is this um, same patient's other eye actually um, without the scleral, but just a couple more inflammatory red eyes that you may see. You know, if I can point out, right. Well, first of all, neurotrophic keratitis, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't fit somebody with neurotrophic keratitis. These, these eyes respond remarkably well to scleral lenses, but something to point out on your picture there, I want to just show on each one of those sutures there, can you mm -hmm. see that there is uh, this really intense neovascularization? 
Yeah. So, like right you know, here. we've already, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about neovascularization. Everybody thinks oxygen, 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 but the reality is it's inflammatory, inflammatory, inflammatory. If you develop mm -hmm. an inflammatory set, uh, setup, that's when you get neovascularization. Oxygen can be one of the things that causes inflammation, but sutures can cause inflammation there as well. And so when you see that, you, you need to get those sutures out as soon as it's safe to do that. Um, I'm assuming this eye had a transplant. That is a really big graft. Yes. That's actually her third transplant on that, um, eye on the right hand side, the left eye, which is why it's so big. <clears throat> yeah. So the risk of rejection is really high here without a, um, without a scleral lens on. Yes. And but I, I will might even consider wearing 24 seven. So actually she was wearing 24 seven on the right eye, which would be on the left hand side. Um, and mm -hmm. then once her defect closed on this right hand side picture, um, she went back, she was wearing continuous for that too, until her defect closed. And then she went back to just regular wear. So just curious, Marcus, when you have a defect like this, um, mm -hmm. what is your protocol for fitting? For like an initial fit? Yeah. Yeah. So the patient presents like this, what would you recommend that our students here on this lecture do? Oh, for something like this, I, one, you always want to try and close the defect, but two, for, from just a fitting standpoint, we, I did impression-based fitting, um, just so we could have a perfect fit over top of this eye. And then I used moxifloxacin, um, with the scleral lens with in continuous wear. And actually that defect, even though it's that large closed up in just a couple days. Yeah. That's usually within a week they'll close with continuous wear. Yeah. And those mm -hmm. eyes will look terrible, won't they? You got to have fortitude. You put that scleral lens on that eye and you just keep it on and it will fill with mucus and it will look absolutely like a zombie. Oh yeah. It was disgusting, but she, she did close up and actually that, that eye with, even with that defect, um, stabilized at 2030. So she did really well. Beautiful. Nice job. Thanks. But yeah. So moving on from, from there. One other one, big one people can often forget about is it is possible to have like a scleritis or an episcleritis if you have underlying systemic disease. It can be easy to have a patient come in with their scleral and have a red eye and blame it on the scleral, but don't forget they can have something else going on too. Changing gears from there, jump into mechanical. Chris, you can go ahead on this All one. Right. So, you know, you always need to lift those eyelids up and see what's up top there, right? So um, sometimes with patients, uh, or even before you fit them into scleral lenses, and, and that's actually uh, this picture here, we were in the, in the process, oops, we were in the process, lift the lids up, and you can see that he's got this superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. At the edge of a scleral lens can cause this, or it can cure it. That's the weird thing about SLK is if they're wearing a lens, take them out. If they're not wearing a lens, put them in. Um, so you don't necessarily know if it's the cause or just a reaction or, or, or just incidental. Okay. Now, if you know, the question we always have is if the eye is red, if you take out the contact lens and the eye is red, how long does it last? Because if you take it out, if, if the eye looks perfectly fine when the contact's on, you take it off, you have a little bit of redness. Um, sometimes that is actually caused by the patient uses the plunger. They push in on the eye. They cause a little negative pressure underneath that lens. And when they pull it out, they'll have a, a very uh, brief momentary rebound hyperemia around the limbus. That shouldn't last typically longer than probably what, Marcus, 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and yeah. it shouldn't hurt when it comes out. The, the, the remedy to this is actually to push in on the eye when you're pulling out so that you release the suction and that you don't push too hard. Um, you know, a lot of my patients, they just really jam that in there and then pull it straight out. And that just pulls that contact lens off. <laughs> Wow. So, you nailed that sound. That was perfect. Um, also, <laughs> what, one thing that I always say to every patient who comes in with, if they complain, there's a red ring around my eye or whatever. Just like you said, first thing I say is first, walk me through how you put your lens in, make sure they're doing it right. And then two, I'll say, okay, show me. And if a lot of times you'll find they just really jam it in too hard and then um, it can cause that ring. So yeah, sometimes ask making the patient show you how they do stuff will unveil what's going wrong. Right. 
there's another now picture. when you take it off and you actually have an impression ring like a divot like you can see where that contact lens was sitting um that that's that's different that's going to indicate that you probably do have a fit issue on that eye or the eye is super squishy right it is possible if you have a very hypotenuse or a very low pressure in the eye um, that, you, that you may actually be squishing down and settling down into that eye a lot, sort of that stiletto heel effect, if you will. You know, the, um, it, your landing zone is too narrow and it's just sinking in. Usually in these cases, you want to, um, uh, one, do not, do not refit that eye when it looks like that. If you have an impression ring on the eye and you refit, you're going to refit into that impression ring. You have to wait till it pops back out again. You know, you have to wait till you normalize the eye and then go ahead and refit. The other thing is you might want to consider a larger landing zone. It's sort of the, you know, a, a stiletto heel shoe, right? Versus a snowshoe will stay above versus a smaller landing zone will sink in more. And how long do you typically wait for? To you need to these really things? wait. It's a great, great, great question. You really need to wait uh, at least 48 hours, but it's going to depend on the lens and how long they've been wearing that lens. You may have to wait up to a week to get it to come back out. Um, mm -hmm. I've looked at a lot of eyes, a lot of impressions, and I've compared how long it takes to, uh, to pop back out. Most is 48 hours, but uh, hybrid lenses could be a week or two, even some, in some cases. Yeah. Well, limbal overvolt or limbal undervolt, right? So you can get this red ring around the eye while the patient is wearing the uh, contact lens. And it can either be because of this is, this is the limbus here. It can either be because you have this giant overvolt situation. So you have almost a, a negative pressure, if you will, sucking the conch up to the back of the lens. Or you could have a situation where the lens is actually landing on the cornea itself. So you have this undervolt situation and it's causing chafing and rubbing of the, uh, of the lens on the eye. Yeah. And there's a great picture of that right here. Right. So in this situation here, you see, this is, um, uh, can you just show where the limbus is there in that case? Yes. So, where yeah, so cornea right here, sclera here, and then limbus is kind of this area, but you can see right. the lens is landing way up here on the cornea or at least right on the limbus. So this is the area we're focusing on. Right. And you, you notice in this picture, the whole thing is tight, but do you see in the photo how angry that limbus actually is? And then you have compression or loss of vascular tissue um, at, right at the edge of the contact lens where it gets even, even tighter. Okay. Yep. So that's a perfect undervolt. And then we also have an overvolt here. Yeah. So in this case here, uh, where the lens, sometimes the lens is slide down a little bit and will create an inferior limbal overvolt. And so you see in this picture here, you've got the conjunctiva is actually sucked up to the back of the lens. The key to this is to either release the pressure. You can put in some fenestration. Sometimes that will, will um, take care of it. Or you really need to define where the limbus is and the shape of the eye. This is a really great picture here, Marcus. If you can show how the, the cornea comes down and the sclera comes up. Uh, right are you there. talking which, There's which sclera one? right there. And then the cornea what? is the dark part below, right? Yeah. So people say, you know, measure your vault, measure your vault. Where do you measure your vault from? We have to standardize this. Okay. And mm -hmm. so where I have the 300 microns there, right, that's from the tip of where the sclera comes on to the back of the contact lens. It's the only place that's going to stay consistent between measuring different patients. And so that's where you should measure that from. Now, how much that is, is going to depend on the design of the contact lens that you're fitting. So there's no one size fits all. There's different amounts of vault from that area that you should have based on the different designs of lenses that you fit. So here's an example of that, that eye that we just looked at, that when you design the contact lens, how the shape of your eye really matters. Now here we're talking about the geometric limbus. 
uh, not the visible limbus because the visible iris diameter, the white to white, that is different, right? Because the white to white, your sclera comes up and your cornea comes down. And the, the length of the sclera is going to be different for every single person. So what we're talking about is the geometric limbus, where you actually have that geometric change between the cornea and the sclera itself. So that geometric limbus is what is important when you go to fit a contact or a scleral Ooh. lens. So in this particular case, sorry, no worries. When it got, this eye, if it's designed as a, as a circle, you can see it's a much bigger area. But if you actually design where that curvature actually ch changes, uh, it, you'll see it's way more of an oval. And down here at the bottom, you can see the, the actual uh, numbers. But if you look here over, can you? Yeah, if you look here, you can see this overvault situation here. This blue line is the is the limbus. The top one is to the to the old one, and the right one is to the new one. Whereas you, if you uh, look at the inferior one, you're going to see you have much less. Oh, yeah, right in that area, much less overvault in that area, and so you won't get that sucking up to the back of the conjunctiva. So you really do need to define where that is. If you have a very oval shaped cornea and you're putting a round lens on it, you are going to have limbal overvolt. The eye is always wider horizontally than it is vertically. Now, the other thing is eyes change over time. So another mechanical change that you might see is uh, bubbles that form under the lens. So graphs will protrude more, cones will proceed more, uh, lifting those lenses up. You always want to make sure that 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 uh, when you do the OCT, you know how much space you have in any of those areas. But the other thing that can happen is sometimes pathology gets better. So if you get over a, a pinguicula, and over time, that pinguicula can actually disappear. It can resolve itself when it's constantly covered and hydrated. And in those cases, when you have a pinguicula that, that disappears, you can actually end up with a bubble underneath the area and it can suck air in under that lens. So you could have insertion problems. Uh, if you have an insertion problem, you can actually put a gel in the bowl of the lens when you put the contact lens on. We use gels all the time for, for children, for babies, for disabled people, people that have to have the lens put in, in the head up position just to avoid these bubbles. But a bubble under the lens is going to give you limbal hyperemia. Right. The other thing is you want to look at impingement where you see that, you know, the compression, the, the, the toe down or the heel down look of the eye. But remember, this is going to be gaze dependent. So in this particular patient here had actually a very well fit scleral lens. But when the patient looked into different gazes, when the extraocular muscles uh, are in action, you're going to see that there's impingement right at the edge of the lens. Um, so you can see here, you got impingement, but when I actually just moved the camera, but had the patient look in straight ahead gaze, there was not any impingement on that lens. So make sure if you see impingement, uh, particularly you're going to see this in down gaze because the patient's going to look down and, and then you see, and you think, oh, it's too tight up there, but it, you got to look at it when they're straight ahead gaze. Yeah, that's the number one. I have this all the time when people are just starting out, um, fitting or early levels of scleral lens fitters, they'll say, yeah, when I check the edges, th they show impingement, but it's because they're having the patient look up to look at the down and then to the side and to the other side. And they're just getting impingement from the gaze, but they actually have really good fits. The upper edge of the lens is pretty hard to see on a lot of patients because you can't maybe lift their lid high enough while they're in primary gaze. So sometimes you have to have them look down a little, but just be aware that the impingement you see might just be gaze induced rather than a poor fit. Yep. The, and the key though is to note where the impingement is, right? So in this case here, you'll see that we get an impingement, but it is mid mid scleral landing zone, not at the edge. So if it's a gaze induced impingement, it will be right at the edge of the lens. But in this case, we're having a heel down, if you will, effect of the, uh, of the lens. On OCT, you may see it dipping down like this, as opposed to dipping down like this. Yeah. 
And of course, you, when you have a subcon team, it you're going to get impingement over that area because you do have swellings. Now, particularly in eyes that um, uh, are underlying inflammatory eyes or, or places where you're getting chronic rubbing, you can have tissue hypertrophy. Um, and so in this case here in the left, you see an eye that's actually quite toric, but has a spherical lens on the eye. So you're getting chronic sort of three, nine, if you will, compression of the tissue. And over time, you're, we are getting this tissue hypertrophy. Now, which I want you to notice is the edge of the lens looks a little blanching, but inside the, le inside the lens and outside the lens, you're getting this hyperemic area. And then the tissue right outside the lens is growing up it's hypertrophying, it's growing up and over the edge of the contact lens. Now, if you look at about in the right hand photo, if you look, yeah, right there, this particular patient is an alkaline burn patient. And these, uh, these will just come and go, you can add steroids, if it's really bothering you, you can, uh, if it's if it's hurting the patient. Uh, but oftentimes, in these cases, you do not have the luxury of taking the patient out of the contact lens. This eye, these eyes are just gonna do things like that. And you have to have a level of comfort living with the redness, living with what you are inducing on the eye because always, always when you fit a scleral lens, you have to ask yourself, what is my end game? Because perfect is often not ever going to happen. You can spend a lot of money and you can make people crazy and you can chase your tail, trying to make something perfect. So you have to live with these little things that, that show up. Um, go, let's go to the next slide. That resolved, by the way, I just saw that patient uh, a couple of days ago and that little tissue has resolved and hasn't come back. It comes and goes. Yeah. He and I have learned a little bit. Um, other things, mechanical issues that uh, scleral lenses can induce are these tube erosions and blebitis. So if you get a rubbing, if, you, if the lens is not vaulting appropriately, which may be a whole other lecture, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can rub and you can cause tube erosions. If you cause a tube erosion, you can end up with endophthalmitis. You can uh, end up with um, blebitis. This is very serious and you can actually uh, uh, induce um, uh, the, the loss of the eye. So be very aware of what you're doing. My recommendation is don't fit tubes unless you fit a lot of tubes. Yeah, this, this, just looking at these two pictures, this is nightmare fuel for me. This is like what I never, ever want <laughs> to see. Um, yeah, but we yeah, don't see it very I, often though, do we? Uh, I, well, I actually have quite a few <laughs> blebs and tubes mixed. Like I have one patient with two tubes and a bleb. Yeah. But, um, well, I meant, I meant a tube erosions because we are oh, erosions. Like, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Erosions. I don't see almost at all, which is great with, we do a lot of impression based for this, but that, that is also another key point is a lot of times um, people will see this and think, oh yeah, I can do an impression based lens and um, it'll just be fine without really knowing how to watch the tube or the bleb and make sure it's healthy and stay away from the, the tube erosion and blebitis. So I agree, unless you're someone who's going to start doing a lot of these types of fits, this is a tough one. You got to be really careful with. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you watch for? If you're going to do a tube, you want to make sure that you don't have any blanching over the tube. Like in the picture on the right there, you can see the it just, the tissue looks different, right? You always want to stain. Uh, you want to look, you want to look both transverse cutting across the tube and then longitudinal uh, over the tube with your OCT uh, to see if you have um uh, any erosions or any, because in this bottom picture here, you can see actually there's conjunctiva over the top, but you can see the tissue underneath is starting to erode. Yeah. And this is something I actually didn't do or realize much until even coming to Iowa is you can actually see. So tube is right here in the top picture and you can see the conj over top of it. And then in the bottom picture, the two would be right here. But yeah, so if you have OCT capabilities, you can actually do an OCT over the tube and measure the thickness of the conge to make sure there's no erosion. Mm -hmm. Just uh, zoomed in another picture of one there. So again, here's the tube right here. 
and then conch tissue above it. And then there's a scleral lens sitting above that. Yeah. So you always want to measure that tissue and then just make sure that it's not thinning over time. Yeah. Good. Perfect. And Here's that's the same eye that had the tube erosions. He's got two tubes in here. So that tube erosion that I showed you earlier, he's now been in this lens for seven or eight years, maybe. I don't know. It's been a long time. And he has not eroded since then. So that, that's what you want it to look like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I'm not showing you all my, my, my red eye, terrible looking eyes. There's a good one, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> And then this last picture I just threw on here for, for foreign body, just because this was kind of another um, kind of strange one, which this patient had a firework um, explode in his hand and ended up burning his eye with an alkaline burn as well. Um, he actually got some ash from the firework stuck in his eye, that tiny little black dot pointed out by the arrow. And you can see some of the ash on his eyelid here with the mouse arrow too. But so this was one where the patient would come in with his scleral and you can see it looks like a really good fit, but there's this one patch of redness right here. And that tiny little dot of ash, is, it looks obvious because I have it pointed out, but it was actually pretty tough to see. And so sometimes patients can have something else like a foreign body on their eye or stuck somewhere that can be causing the redness too. And, or under the lens, most commonly like a hair or something like that, but don't you know, want to forget about those either. It's, it's interesting to point out there though. It looks like he's already getting some neovascularization to that point right there. Like all roads lead to Rome, right? So even how long had that been in there? Just a couple of days? Uh, a week or so, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Week, yeah. Week so. And you can see it's already has new vascularization. So blood vessels can grow in really fast, like yeah, really fast, even within a day or two. And one of the weird things, if it's an embedded foreign body, like something like that, it can actually work itself out over time too. So you might have something that's buried in the cornea or conj and then a few months yeah. surface. So keep those over time. All right. All right. Now everybody blames on hypoxia. And I would have to say it is probably a pretty rare complication uh, of, of uh, scleral lens induced red eye, um, at least not acute scleral lens induced red eye. Um, I worry more about hypoxic related uh, changes to the endothelium or edema over time. Uh, but you can have limbal injection and, and neovascularization uh, secondary to hypoxia. We can talk about some ways to increase oxygen there. Yeah, I agree. Hypoxia gets a bad rap, but um, I think that unless you have a compromised endothelium or a PK, the neo and mechanical stuff is usually your go-to, but continue right, on. Right, right. So just to remember, if you have a hypoxic situation that in, builds up lactic acid into your eye, which causes edema, which causes your stroma to soften, uh, then you get these migration of inflammatory cells. And the inflammatory cells are actually what brings in the uh, neovascular vessels. That last component that you need to log that into your head, inflammatory cells bring in neovascular vessels. So really the key, the thing that you should always be asking yourself when you see inflammatory, when you see neovascular vessels into the cornea is what is the root cause of my inflammation, right? Is it hypoxia? Is it limbal stem cell? Is it, a, you know, uh, 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 infectious? I mean, you got lots of reasons, but why are inflammatory cells there bringing these blood vessels into the cornea? So uh, hypersensitivity, wow, we talk about this quite a bit, don't we, Marcus? Um, yes, we do. <laughs> so what are some causes of it? Uh, it could be your contact lens solutions or the coatings on the lenses. If a patient could be allergic to the material itself, or it could be something that is uh, induced environmentally and, and, and added onto the lens. So... All right, so let's start with toxins on the lens. It turns out that a clean lens is a happy eye. And so you can see this, this image on the, on the left. This is a patient I just saw recently, um, was, came in wearing a, uh, a contact lens that uh, during the pandemic, 
my patients, I usually see them every six months. And for some reason, I'm starting to see patients that I haven't seen for a couple of years are starting to come back to my practice now. So I'm starting to see a lot of pretty dirty contact lenses. Even if the patient cleans it really well, um, uh, they get the, they're getting these red eyes. Typically, these patients are going to say, I was fine. Now I'm getting a red eye. It's uncomfortable, painful. You just replace the lens and then their eye looks much, much happier. So never forget the toxins on the lens. The best way to look for uh, deposits on the lens, even if the lens looks clean on the eye, dry the contact lens off with a lint-free cloth, hold it up to the light and look through it. And, and you can see these whitish deposits. Those are things that the, con that the patient is going to react to. Now, I don't know if you guys, if you get hydropeg there or polyethylene glycol that's bonded to the surface of the lens, but I saw a significant uptick in lens-induced red eyes with the addition of the polyethylene glycol. Now, I'm not saying it's the peg itself that's the problem. I don't think the tangible hydropeg is the actual issue. I think the issue is people are afraid of taking the hydropeg off the lens because they think it's gonna make it slipperier or more wet. And now they're not cleaning the lens as well. And they're not getting all of those toxins off the contact lens because a deep clean on the lens will remove the hydropeg. But once you have deposits on the lens, you have the deposits because you don't have the peg on the lens. So I really think of the hydro peg as the thing that causes the lens to wet to get the patient out my door. But then they really do need to clean that contact lens and get those toxins off the lens. I could, I could spend a whole hour just on that topic. <laughs> toxins are crazy. And this one. Yeah. The Definitely. other thing is you have to remember the patient's eyelids. So again, these, when you see telangiectatic vessels, you have toxins on the eye, right? Because you get telangiectatic vessels because you have inflammation. Remember neovascular vessels, whether it's in the cornea or on your eyelid, neovascular vessels are there because of inflammatory product, because you have inflammatory cells. So you really need to pay attention to the eyelids as well, because you could get a scleral lens induced red eye because of the toxins on the lid and the scleral lens just holds those toxins to the eye itself. So in this case, um, and what I typically, this is a Stevens Johnson's patient. So it's going to be a chronic eye. Uh, you, you need to clean those lids, even go in with a golf club spud and physically remove that keratin. This patient loves his keratin removed so much that he drives four hours to come to see me just eat one way just to get his eyelids cleaned uh, so that he can um, uh, feel comfortable and, and wear his lens without incident. Now, giant papillary conjunctivitis can be one of two things. It can be mechanical or it can be allergic. Uh, and so when you see like one very large papilla, think edge of lens, think something that's mechanically stimulating that. Um, if you see diffuse papilla over the entire surface, uh, think more allergic. Okay? And then uh, modify whether you have to change the fit or whether you have to change the uh, carrying of the lens accordingly. And I'm going to pop ahead a couple here, but this is a good one we need to touch on. Yes. Oh my goodness. These eosinophil eosinophilic lens material reactions. Remember before when I talked about is the redness outside the lens or is the redness underneath the lens? This is an underneath the lens case. So these eosinophilic reactions, the entire eye is not red, just under the contact where the contact lens touches is, is red. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, an eosinophilic reaction, you will see uh, a limbal stem cell issue over time, and you will see um, these, see those little white dots? Those are clusters of eosinophils. So when you get um, blood vessels, neovascular vessels that are going into the cornea, you're going to see you know, a cluster of eosinophils. Now, this can happen because of a dirty contact lens. It can happen because of the silicone in the contact lens itself, but they, they're mounting an eosinophilic reaction to that lens. Uh, the, typically what you'll see with these patients is the patient will tell you, uh, perhaps I've been wearing this contact lens for a long time without problems. Now I am having a problem with this lens. Every lens I put on now has an issue. Uh, you need to calm these patients down with steroids. You need to get them on an oral um, antihistamine. And uh, Marcus, I think your next slide shows 
you need to put them on a topical antihistamine as well. How did you handle this patient? Yeah. So this is a patient who came in, um, she had been wearing sclerals for about six months and uh, she said she had problems and she sent me this picture of her eyes. Well, these, both these two pictures over here, you can see obviously on the picture on the left, it's red just under the lens. Like Dr. Sint was saying, we had her come in and check it out. And it looked like the, like I can't say (laughs) there it is conjunctivitis before, um, with her scleral. So what we did is we, we put her on cetirizine 10 milligrams. So just Zyrtec and allergy medicine. And we actually started her on olopatidine antihistamine eye drops. So before she would put her scleral in, in the morning, she would put a drop of an antihistamine in and then put the scleral in right after. And I apologize for the poor quality because the patient sent me these pictures herself during COVID times. And so you can see still, even though the quality is poor, that the redness is way less or even completely gone, particularly in this area on the superior limbus. So really for people who are having this, you do have kind of three treatment options, which is oral allergy meds, topical allergy meds, or worst case scenario, try a different material. And then don't forget the eyelid itself. So flip the eyelid because there's two surfaces to a contact lens, the, the, the eyeball to lens, but you also have the lens to eyelid uh, a surface as well. I've had, to, I've had some of these patients where I've had to change them out into a non-silicone material. Yeah. All right. How are we doing on time? This was, we're, we're, we're okay. I think we'll okay. get there. Let's go for it. All right. So, so microbial keratitis, this is the big bad guy, right? Hate this one. It's in your chair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a infection by microbes. I'm sure um, everyone's seen some sort of microbial keratitis before. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but this is an infiltration and necrosis of tissue. Hopefully if this was in your chair, you would know something's not right. It's pretty rare with a scleral lens though. Yes, actually, I'm working on a study right now to figure out the actual incidence of it, of microbial keratitis and scleral lenses, because we really don't know. But anecdotally, it does seem less, much less even than soft lenses and things. Mm -hmm. Um, Um, You know, often it's their case where these microbes are coming from or the Petri dish they put the lens in. Yeah, and this one looks disgusting, but um, there's a bunch of different risk factors, things like trauma, when something new is introduced to the ocular surface, obviously it can bring infection cases, or just abusing your your contacts by sleeping in them overnight, and things like swimming as well. So here's a, a picture of an eye with with some redness. And just like you said, all, all roads lead to home or to room with the uh, red, the redness, the blood vessels point to essentially where that infection is. So you can see on this right hand picture, this hazy whitish area. But if you have an infectious uh, eye or a keratitis, you'll see the blood vessels from the conch kind of point exactly where that infection is. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I'm fond of saying at the, at the hospital is <laughs> if you're not sure, it's always herpetic. Always. <laughs> it's, it's always herpes. Herpes is absolutely everywhere. You probably see herpes every single day. It is always herpes. So you will never go wrong just starting your patient on oral antivirals uh, because the, the safety profile of the oral antivirals is, is pretty good. Um, it's, it's a very safe medication to take. Uh, but this is herpetic. When you see these localized um, lim- uh, lymphitis looking things, always, always in your differential, it, you need to have herpes. Did I say that strongly enough? <laughs> it's always it. herpes. <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm putting every patient on it. <laughs> yeah, just dip them in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Changing gears to chemical here. I'll let you take this one. All right. So chemical burns can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, this is sort of an area that I'm working on right now or limbal stem cells um, with some of my research. Uh, but when you have a uh, limbal stem cell uh, 
trauma and that can happen from a burn. It can happen from, uh, it can happen from blepharitis. It can happen from anything toxic that's on the ocular surface uh, can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency. And this will give you incredibly aggressive neovascularization into the cornea. You'll get lots of clarity. Um, this patient was a, a, a limbal stem cell uh, or, or a chemical burn from about, gosh, a long time ago, like 30, 40 years ago, uh, it developed a desmetacil in the center of the cornea and had to have an emergent uh, uh, tectonic PKP, and then came back to me for a scleral lens. The patient is wearing the scleral lens in this case uh, for uh, protection, for um, comfort, uh, for integrity of the ocular surface, not for vision. Okay, so, um, you know, a lot of times these liberal stem cell cases, they, they hurt a lot because the uh, cornea is pretty much open. Right. Kind of a throwback to that grab versus host at the beginning of the lecture. Mm -hmm. Same concept. So hydrogen peroxide burns, right? Uh, so hydrogen peroxide is becoming more popular to clean the contact lenses with. Uh, and I, I agree with that. You need to have a three hour soak in straight up hydrogen peroxide in order to kill the micro or all the microorganisms, in including acanthamoeba that may be on the surface of the lens. If you have a toxicity problem, if somebody has a very toxic tissue around their eyes or, you know, uh, or, um, uh, you know, you have that inflammatory situation, peroxide helps with that. Not not peroxide where you neutralize it right away, a three hour soak in, in peroxide. Uh, but of course, the problem that you have with that is that you then have to rinse the peroxide off the lens. So if you get peroxide in the eye, you can denude the entire cornea and get all of the epithelium off the eye. Uh, and that is unfortunate. I tell my patients, if they do this, they're going to have to call me, they're going to have to tell me that they did it. And I am going to have to laugh at them. Um, and so we all need to avoid that situation. <laughs> this, this hurts a lot. <laughs> um, other toxic buildups that you get on the, the uh, contact lens is your, your solutions themselves. Uh, the, the, buff, the, buff, uh, the buffer uh, borate is actually a, is buffers. You Patients are typically more comfortable if their solution is buffered, but the flip side of that is some patients can have a buffer, um, a buffer issue. So you need to watch for that and see what it is that you're buffering the patient with, whether it's borate, borate buffers tend to be a little toxic in some patients. You may want to switch that to a, uh, a potassium uh, buffer uh, it, uh, for the patient or go with non-buffered. Non-buffered salines, however, have an acidity problem to them, and that can cause toxicity to the eye. Um, and of course, the preservatives, if you're using a preserved product, can cause toxicity to the eye as well. Um, the other option when you see this diffuse staining like that is you may actually have an ocular rosacea issue um, and a very subacute uh, limbal stem cell deficiency that you're brewing there as well. So uh, if you see this diffuse staining, those, those are the things that should be in your differential diagnosis. Yeah. And one thing just to add to this, if you do have a, a patient that you suspect has a preservative toxicity or something like that, your first thought can be just change them to a different drop, but a lot of drops use the same preservatives or, or buffers. And so you, so that, that's not usually the answer. Um, typically I will try and switch people instantly to a preservative free formulation. Is that what you do as well, Dr. Sim? Right. Yeah. Start with a preservative free formulation. Then you want to look at what, what it's buffered with. Um, uh, and then you want to look and say, do I have another issue going on? Do I have an underlying disease that I'm trying to treat with the fit? <laughs> So. Exactly. And great segue to underlying disease with the next slide. Wow. Yeah. So glaucoma drugs are nasty. They are mean to the ocular surface and they will cause red eye and your scleral lens can trap them in the eye. Um, and so one of the things that I do recommend is when you instill your glaucoma drug, then do lid hygiene um, uh, right after you put in the glaucoma drug. So you take anything that off that's on the, the lids uh, that might be inducing a mybomitis, a blepharitis situation, because that is then in turn inducing um, a toxicity reaction or inflammatory reaction to the ocular surface. 
Exactly. And then I just added this last slide on because this actually happened to me. I had a patient who had a um, was using amiodarone for a long period of time and actually had a, a red eye from the cornea verticillata or the world keratopathy. Um, so that this is probably a little less likely, but don't forget about your, your underlying systemic drugs because those can have toxic effects on your cornea as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, right. think I think this is our, our last, last topic one. here. I think we're going to get into, I think we're going to hit our time mark here, Marcus. All right. Okay, let's dry do it. Eye, right? Well, we talked a little bit about neuro neurotrophic keratopathy. Um, you know, the problem is, is when you're neurotrophic, patients don't feel it. So sometimes they do silly things like they plunge their cornea or they rub. You know, I, I recently had a, a, a baby girl that I just fit earlier this week, 15 month old, who, um, has a, has a neurotrophic cornea, has a ptosis, and she holds her eyelid up like this. I'll, I'll post this case in a while, but uh, she, um, she holds her eyelid up like this, but the problem she does is she, she wipes her cornea as she posts, holds her wow. eyelid up and she can't feel it. So then um, she's developing this, this neurotrophic ulcer on her cornea. Mm. Scleral lenses are great for this, but you have to watch them carefully. So exposure also can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, so you can see, again, this is a ptosis patient. Uh, and you can see where the eyelid is covered. The eye looks, the well, it isn't red, but where there's chronic exposure, how red that eye is. This is not a scleral lens issue. This is a, um, an exposure issue. Now, remember, if you have an eye like this, where you have a lot of exposure at the bottom, when you go to fit, as soon as you cover that up, the geometric shape of the eye is going to change. So sometimes you fit. And when you see this, you're going to have to bring them back and you're going to have to refit again. Yeah. Now we talked about redness under the lens, redness at the limbus, redness under the lens. When you have redness outside the lens, that's always, that's also an exposure issue as well. Um, and so you might want to think, just pull on the lids a little bit to see how floppy those eyelids are. I tell patients you have an exposure issue. It's like if you have windshield wipers up on your car, but your windshield wipers aren't fully touching your windshield or aren't working right. That's also an exposure issue. Yeah. And sometimes you'll see something similar to this in the really, really um, just dry patients, even without floppy lids because the part of their eye that's not covered by the lens gets, gets irritated. So not exclusive to floppy lids, but you see a little more with that for sure. Right. The other thing you want to look for is subtle retraction. This patient had been to several doctors before they got to me. Um, this is a young man. Um, and what I want you to notice here is when they tried scleral lenses on him before his eye got, his temporal eye got really, really red. And I want you to, if Marcus, if you could point out his right eye, the upper eyelid of his right eye, okay? He actually has, temporally there, he actually has exposure in that area. And you'll see he's got a little bit of subtle lid retraction, okay? And it is your job to notice the placement of the eyelids. Don't just skip right over the eyelids and think scleral lens. You got to look for these subtle underlying diseases. So this young man here actually had undiagnosed thyroid eye disease. Now, what a strange population. You know, if the patient looks like me, an older woman, you might think, mm, you probably got some thyroid. I'm going to check you for it. But in a young man, that would be pretty rare. But he had undiagnosed thyroid eye disease. He's got lid retraction associated with that. And so therefore he has exposure. You have to talk about that because even now without a scleral lens, you can see that temporal area is red there. Now, here's another example uh, of where uh, you have a, a very, in these keratoconics, they have a collagen issue. And so they will often have floppy eyelids. They will often be larger people, more obese people. They'll have um, a sleep apnea associated with this, all things that you should think do I have some type of a lid issue going on? So in this gentleman here, he actually has a lower lid droop. So because of the collagen issue, his face is kind of drooping down a little bit and that's giving him this exposure. Now, what I want you to notice here in this picture here with the, the, the temporal exposure and the hyperemia, this is 
people for some reason keep saying, I need to change the fit. I need to change the fit. I look at this picture and I say, great job with the fit because the area under the lens is actually super happy. What you really need to do is put the patient's whole head in a fishbowl, right? I mean, this patient, <laughs> this patient needs everything covered. This is not a fit issue next to the lens. Now, why do they get more red when they're wearing a lens? Because that eyelid or the, the contact lens pushes the eyelid forward just a little bit right? And though you have this lens, this eyelid situation that's not fully opposed to the globe, it pushes the, the contact lens pushes that eyelid forward, therefore creating a space between the eyelid and the globe next to where the contact lens is not. This patient does not need a change in fit. This patient needs a lateral, um, uh, a tarsal, uh, play or a lateral tarsal uh, strip it needs to have that eyelid pulled back, tightened up and pulled back against the globe. And that will get rid of that, that exposure area or help with yeah. it. At least. I can't believe how many people's um, complaining of pain and or irritation and poor fits does have to do with their eyelids, which that's an entire other lecture. But this is something that I've just recently had when people come in and they're like, yeah, I've tried 10 different sclerals, nothing works. And then check out their eyelids, see how that affects things. And then, and then Marcus, you look at him and go, yeah, it's your face. Your face is really the issue here. <laughs> well, yeah. Have you considered getting this fixed first? That's what <laughs> <Yeah>. I... <laughs> All right. And then of course you can have exposure um, when you have burn. This is a burn victim here. Um, and the lower right hand corner picture was when I first saw him. But you see in, in these burn victims that the skin will tighten up over time. So you want to get a lens on to cover as much of the cornea as possible, because the goal here is to cover the cornea so that you don't lose corneal clarity. Um, but the skin will retract over time. Any area that is not covered the sclera it's not the conjunctiva that's not constantly covered is going to keratinize is going to keratinize okay it's going to turn into skin you can't help it cover as much as you can here's an example of exposure keratinization there that will be completely non-wetting in that area it's turning into skin So what can you do? You can create an ovate lens or a lens that is um, uh, wider horizontally or cover as much of the eye as possible. When you start getting into this, it works really well. And I'll, I will tell you in my, in my clinical trial studies, uh, ovate lenses are um, significantly more comfortable actually uh, when you have these exposure areas. The problem is ovate lenses are very time consuming and therefore expensive to make. It, it probably takes about two hours to cut an ovate lens just for uh, understanding a regular scleral round scleral lens probably takes about five minutes. So it, it is, it is a more expensive lens, but you can see on the, on the right hand pictures here, this is uh, a round lens, took it off, put the ovate lens on. And on the left hand side, this is uh, a couple of months after wearing that ovate lens. You can see how, just how happy that that eyelid has become. Okay, Last next. one. All right. Mucus fishing syndrome. Okay. So this is a dry eye situation where the patient sticks their finger in their eye and pulls a long string of mucus out. This will cause the eye to be red and itself begets itself. A patient who will actually erode their cornea if they keep pulling that string of mucus out. So they have to not do that. Remember, mucus is caused by inflammation. So if they keep self-inducing inflammation, they are going to make their whole situation worse. I recommend they get a saline vial, so just squirt it out. Do you have a different recommendation, Marcus? Nope, that's what I do. I'll often tell them to keep the saline in the fridge. So that way they get kind of that cool component to it too. But these yeah, people, they love it. I, I tell them literally, sit on your hands. And if you have to, use a cold saline vial. But mm -hmm. other than that, no touching. Right. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think in conclusion, you know, scleral lens induced red eyes, you know, your, your first thought shouldn't be, how do I change the fit? Your first shot thought should be, I have inflammation. Why? What things about this patient, their, their systemic health, their ocular health, their skin, their tissue, their eyelids, what 
things about this patient could be inducing inflammation? And then how do I control that inflammation? Exactly. But great. Well, that's all we have. So thank you guys for listening. Is there any questions we can answer? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the pictures were wonderful as uh, you know, we were saying in the beginning, it's more of a picture talk and it really tells the whole story on the how to go about and what we are looking for. And I think most of the conditions which you mentioned are quite oftenly seen in a practice and uh, it's very good that we know now how to manage them efficiently rather than just saying that refer to ophthalmology all the time, right? <laughs> Right. I'm, most of these exactly. things, ophthalmology doesn't want to see. Right. They want you to manage it, right? Because you're talking chronic, a lot of hand holding, you know, they just yeah. want to know what to cut out. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's, that was my first kind of uh, initial, initial question or probably a discussion on, let's say we have a red eye patient and what would be the time then that you would refer to ophthalmology. I know you have talked about all the managements of all the red eye kind of differentials, but what's the time where you would say, okay, this is something which I should probably co-manage or straight away refer to ophthalmology? Uh, for me, that would only be if they need surgery. Okay. So if, they're, if their cornea perforates or something like that. <laughs> right. We, Marcus and I are very fortunate uh, to our practice location because, um, uh, you know, we work, we do work at a hospital. Um, and so we have access to very high level care, right? We have access to, to everything that we can, we can do ourselves, right? So as Marcus said, typically we look at surgical things. Does the endothelium need to be replaced? Is this person going to perf? Is it emergent? Do we... Um, but, but I would say, I, depending on your level of practice, the questions that you should be asking yourself is um, going through the differential, you know, what of those things can I, do I feel comfortable managing or do I not feel comfortable managing? So uh, does, it, does this patient need to be cultured, right? That would be an example. Uh, does this patient have a, a systemic situation that needs to be managed? So for example, being at a hospital, it may not be that I need to refer the patient to ophthalmology. I need, I may need to refer the patient back to their, um, their oncologist because they're having an, an inflammatory issue because of their graft versus host disease. And we need to manage that underlying uh, inflammatory issue. Do I need to pull in other specialists like, like an, um, an oculoplastics doctor, you know, is this, is this, if it's a lid issue, I need to be able to talk to the oculoplastics doctor and say like, look, we need to fix this eyelid. Do I need to refer the patient to an endocrinologist like that patient with the thyroid eye disease? Now, often, mm -hmm. you know, we'll work the patient up first and say, hey, this is the disease I think they have, and then make the referral on. Uh, but I think it's really going to depend on the level of comfort that, that people have with managing what the actual issue is. Um, I agree. Always herpes. It's always herpes. I, you know, it's funny, Marcus, that we only have like one slide on here showing herpetic disease, but I, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't see herpetic disease with a sclerosis. Yeah, we could. We that would have been fun to make every single one a herpetic red eye, just <laughs> every picture, right? and, and then all at the end the be like, it's all it herpes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it just it doesn't matter what you think it shows up like. It's herpes. You know, it could yeah. be. It could be microbial, another bacteria and herpes. It could be, I don't know, it's always herpes. <laughs> right, as we say in routine lenses, right? If, if in doubt, throw them out. So it, in this case, we would say, if in doubt, consider herpes. <laughs> That's right. If in doubt, herpetic. <laughs> uh, there's one question here. It probably is kind of uh, related to this, but when it comes to hypoxia, we do get some refractive shifts most likely it's a myopic ship. Uh, any thoughts over that on why could this happen or how could we probably explain that? Yeah, so that actually, that's a whole separate lecture. Um, Marcus and I, I think, just gave that lecture to our residents earlier this spring. Um, so many slides associated with that. 
Uh, you know, actually, you know, they, uh, studies show that maybe there's up to maybe a half a diopter shift with it. Other studies have shown that there's actually not a lot of myopic shift, uh, but there's there's a couple of things. But one is it typically um, when you have hypoxic situation, if the endothelium is is not uh, functioning property properly, you can get a little bit of, of stromal edema, and a little bit of stromal edema can actually cause a, a, a myopic shift. Uh, or more plus power, if you will, in the cornea can cause a myopic shift. Um, uh, but it wouldn't typically cause, you know, diopters of myopic shift. It'll maybe a half a diopter or so over time. Wh where we really saw this was, um, I'm going to date myself now because I did practice before we had silicone containing uh, soft lens. <laughs> but where we really saw this was we took our soft lens patients uh, and typically our high minus or our high plus soft contact lens patients and put them into um, silicon hydrogel lenses and they would sh shift down maybe half a diopter or so um, after that. Right. Uh, the myopic shift doesn't bother me too much. What it's doing to the endothelium might bug me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's one question I, I, we just came to me directly. I'm just going to read that for you. Uh, in your practice, when it comes to red eye, uh, how many of them are related to fitting versus having own ocular conditions or systemic condition related? So the more it, people want to know the red eye is more due to fitting what you see routinely or you see them more due to the patient's own systemic conditions? Well, our fits are always perfect, right? Exactly. We've never had a bad one, either one of us. We never had a bad one. <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? I, okay, but, but seriously, though, um, people better have a reason to be fit into a scleral lens. I don't fit scleral lenses just because somebody wants to be pretty, right? But, uh, I, but I have on occasion fit, um, you know, I've, I've got some young, high um, cylinder patients that are high functioning for whatever reason that we put into scleral lenses, uh, for functionality who don't really have underlying diseases and they, they rarely have red eyes, rarely, you know, um, the reason that you fit is probably the reason whether they're going to have a red eye or not. Um, I, I don't know, Marcus, this is, I'm just spitballing here. Um, I would probably say my cones have less red eyes than my GBHD and my SJS oh, and my yeah, II sure. patients, and my neurotrophic patients and right. Um, so, but even keratoconus is a underlying inflammatory condition as well. Right. Yeah. So the question really is why am I getting inflammation and could it be fit? Yes. But could it be something else? You have to have a complete differential. Don't just go randomly changing a fit is what I'm saying. You know? Right. And that, that actually is kind of the entire point of the lecture is that when you see a red eye, everyone rushes to change the fit. But in reality, I mean, it can be you have a bad fit, but in reality, there's usually something else going on. There's inflammation, there are eyes dry, there's toxic. And so this, this point of this lecture is to say, you don't always have to change the fit instantly. If it's red, it's likely because the patient is diseased. Is there something else going on? So focus more on treating the eye than having that perfect fit, quote unquote. Right. right. Yeah. The lens itself is causing the inflammation. You know, I, I did a lot of studies in the, uh, oh gosh, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, where I looked at inflammatory progression into onto the ocular surface. And it doesn't matter what type of contact lens, even a day, daily disposable contact lens, you can actually watch the dendritic cells migrate into the cornea just by having the presence of the contact lens on the, on an eye itself. So having a contact lens in the eye is not completely benign. Um, and, and so you need to consider that, that as well. A contact lens is an inflammatory inducing thing. Um, but, but the, Fitting techniques are also know your fitting set really, really well. I've been fitting scleral lenses. Embarrassing to say this, but I've been fitting scleral lenses for over 25 years. And um, I, I've, I have, I have really ticked off a lot of eyes. And I'm going to tell you, I, I have learned some of the things I do and some of the things I don't want to do. One of the reasons I actually went to impression based lenses is because I was inducing a lot of fits and I just literally did not have time in my practice to worry about how the lens is fitting because I really wanted to worry about the disease itself. Um, and, and so 
if you if you touch the limbus, you're going to cause redness. If you impinge, you're going to cause redness. If you touch the cornea, you're going to cause redness. So ideally, you should hover the lens above the eyeball itself somewhere here. <laughs> right. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think with that, we I've taken up, uh, you know, the questions which popped up on the chat. So uh, again, thank you so much for spending okay. your Sunday morning with us and, you know, taking us through all that uh, things. If, we if, if anybody thinks of questions later, they can always send me an email. They can send me a my chart message, whatever. Um, yep. I got my chart. Facebook. That's the word I'm looking for. They can send me a <laughs> Facebook message. Um, exactly. And I'll, yep. I'll try to answer. <laughs> but thank you guys for having us. This was a lot of fun. Great to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank right. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, bye. Bye. We do have a session planned next weekend. Until then, take care, be safe. And I wish to see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.